Welcome everyone. Uh, uh, should we start the uh, let's start the stream? Uh, so yeah, welcome to the last talk of our, which is on the day of the train strikes and on Saturday. Um, but we are very happy to have John uh, give us a, uh, a talk on entanglement bootstrap and Kirby store Torus trick and remote detectability. And uh, yeah, so uh, please do ask questions and interrupt. Oh, one thing, uh, John, just so you know, um, we you can't really hear us, I think, while you're speaking. So if somebody wants to ask a question, we have to wait for a for a break in your voice. Uh, so, uh, so just to make kind of try to make natural breaks where people can make uh, raise their voice and ask a question if that's okay. Okay, should I start? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. All right so th thanks very much. Um, yeah. Thank, thanks to Nabil and Tin and and David, all the other organizers for putting together this great great meeting. Um, I've been I've been uh, participating to the to the extent that I can um, from from afar. Um, and uh, yeah, thank and thanks for for letting me participate from afar. Um, so my my talk is about uh, a somewhat different path to QFT. Um, it's a path paved with uh, quantum information and uh, maybe a little bit of differential topology. And uh, my, ma my, my main goal is to explain to you the meaning of the terms in the title. Um, and in particular, what, what is Entanglement Bootstrap, which is a, which is a program. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what it's a program for. But it's a program that was uh, really, I have to say, pioneered by Bowen Sheep who's a postdoc at UCSD, and along with Isaac Kim. Uh, and, um, uh, and then some of the work that I'll tell you about in the second half of the talk is also with my student, Jin Long. Um, okay, so, so here we go. So a big goal, which I'm not going to accomplish by any means in this talk, is, is, to answer the, is to learn to answer the following question. So suppose someone hands you uh, a density matrix of some quantum matter, uh, in a simply connected region of space. So here's a, here's a picture of, of some, you know, I want to imagine that there's some underlying quantum lattice model and we only have the, de so, and also I want to imagine that, yeah, so, okay. And suppose we only know the density matrix in this ball B. Um, the question is, can you, from that information, extract the universal properties of the phase represented by that wave function? So this is a, you know, if, without any further qualifiers, this is a very ambitious goal. It's not clear that, that one can do it. It's not clear, you know, I haven't said where the wave function came from. It could be just a bunch of garbage. Um, uh, it's maybe a little more plausible that we can answer it if the wave function is guaranteed to be the ground state of some local Hamiltonian. And to, to make the goal a little bit more accessible, let me, let me restrict to uh, the assumption that the wave function is the ground state of some gapped topologically ordered state. And, and the, the adjective liquid here means that I don't want to talk about fractons. Okay, so it's essentially it's a it's a, a phase of matter which which can be described by a topological field theory at low energies. That's 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 an assumption that we'll we'll build in, in in a way that I'll explain. And the goal is to extract the information of you know all of the universal information in that topological field theory, which you know is some topological field theory is some complicated machine that the mathematicians like to build or at least to talk about. Yeah, build actually they don't build it; they just talk about it. Um, and, and so the question is whether we can do this just from the, just from a single wave function. And there's some, there's some evidence that this is possible. Oh, I guess, sorry, I should, at first I should say what, what I mean by yeah, topological order. By topological order, I mean a gap phase with, with a stable ground state degeneracy. So stable meaning if you deform the Hamiltonian a little bit, the ground state degeneracy persists. And moreover, a ground state degeneracy that depends on the topology of space. So that's what I mean by topological order. Okay, and I already said what I meant by liquid. Um, and no, so you have a question, John? Yeah, great. What, what, why is liquid the right word to use to rule out fractons? Oh, because so it's essentially it's something you could pour over space. <laughs> it's something you can sort of uh, spread on space. Like yeah, maybe 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 uh, like jam is a better analogy. You can like spread it over space, and it, it if you add a little bit of space, it uh, sort of smoothly deforms, and the number of, in particular the number of ground states doesn't change if you make space a little bit bigger. I see uh, that that that's the key fact is the the last part. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's actually a pretty good adjective. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay, so there actually have been some, there are some successes in this direction. In particular, um, there's this quantity called topological entanglement entropy, which was introduced by these folks, I guess it was yeah, 15 years ago or so, which you can extract just from, from the subleading term of the entanglement entropy of a, of a ball. Um, so the entropy, the, the Venom entropy of our state uh, goes like a leading term, which is like, which goes like the area of the region, which is not universal. It depends on details at the cutoff, but there's a subleading term, which is independent of the size of the region, which um, extracts the total quantum dimension. That's, that's uh, some particular information about the topological field theory, which is something like, uh, you know, some weighted, some weighted sum over all the anions. So it's one, one piece of data that, that these guys learned to extract. So that's some evidence that this, is, this idea is along the right track. And then much more recently, um, some work also by Bowen and collaborators showed that there's a way to extract the chiral central charge in, just from the wave function on a ball. So, if, so uh, in particular, by studying the, um, a collection of reduced density matrix, say we can study the, the reduced density matrix of A and B and C, each of, each of which are part of the ball. And uh, by studying the commutator of the logarithm of those reduced density matrices, you can extract the chiral central charge, meaning um, that if, if you put the topological order on a space with an actual boundary, what would be the C, C left minus C right of the edge states? Um, so those are some some partial successes in this direction, but that's you know that's only two pieces of data, and a topological field theory is specified by you know and contains a lot more data than that. Um, and an apparent obstacle, which I'll call frowny face, is that um, topological field theory is you know it's a machine that eats interesting manifolds and spits out invariants, right? So in particular, you want to be able to input into the topological field theory you know a genus twelve Riemann surface or something like that, and and get some number. But if I'm only telling you the wave function in a ball, you might think that, well, how can I possibly learn anything about, about, about closed manifolds? Um, so, okay, so I wanna I'm gonna explain how to overcome this problem. That's where Kirby's Taurus trick comes in. So, but maybe I should back up a little bit and, and try to motivate the limited question that I'm asking just about topological order. So there's a, so in two plus one dimensions, there's sort of a, a pretty good conjecture for how to label all topological phases all, all of, of, that can arise as in this way. Um, and the conjecture is that it's labeled by a unitary modular tensor category and the, the chiral central charge. So I won't say what a unitary modular tensor category is, except to say that, that's, um, that this is a conjecture and a target for the entanglement bootstrap, this program that I just described, is to understand all of the data in that fancy word uh, just from the starting point. So that's that's one goal in two dimensions. But in other dimensions, e even what is the object that replaces unitary modular tensor category is, is not clear. So it's, it's not clear that we know all the possible labels on topological phases in dimensions other than two plus one. And, and moreover, it's not even clear that we know like all the possibilities for topological excitations. Like, you know, so in two plus one dimensions, there are anions, which are particle, particle like excitations, which, you know, have some long distance effects. Uh, they can't be, in particular, they can't be created locally by a local operator. Um, and all of the analogs of those in other dimensions. So, you know, in, in three dimensions, there can be particles, there can also be loops, of loop excitations, which are, which are a closed string. Um, and in fact, there can be lots of other things as I'll, as I'll describe. Um, and so, you know, it would be nice to understand the structure from some minimal assumptions. And then there's another point of view from which this is an interesting question, which is that a, a, a phase of matter with topological order is a, um, well, if you put, the, for example, the number of ground states on some particular manifold is an invariant. It's an invariant, not only of the phase of matter, but also of that manifold, right? It's, it's uh, you know, if one is interested in, in, in labeling uh, manifolds, uh, it's interesting to have, you know, some set of integers associated with them. And this is something that people have been doing for a long time. And we, and I think an interesting and not entirely solved question is how does the set of invariants that you get from putting topological order on, on various spaces relate to the invariants that mathematicians have been studying for, for decades? Um, okay. So that those are some questions that might lead one to want to think about this, uh, this program. And I should say there's, there's lots of, lots of related work, but most of which is from a point of view of, of, uh, uh, 
let's say, trying to trying to develop the analog of the modular tensor cat unitary modular tensor categories. They're trying to build some kind of category theory, which which frames the answer to this question. And uh, that 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 kind of theory involves a set of assumptions, and those those assumptions are things we can hope to prove from from the point of view that I'm going to describe. Okay, so 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 here here are my goals for for the talk. I, so I want to spend the first part of the talk, I guess, until the break, trying just trying to tell you what what entanglement bootstrap is, what what it's accomplished so far, um, what the idea of it is, and then and then in the second part, I want to explain a method. Uh, that we're working on now to develop to overcome this frowny face obstacle. So which which yeah, like I said, involves a quantum avatar of, of this trick from differential topology, which I'll tell you what it is. Um, and then and then an application of of you know what we gain by overcoming that obstacle is using it to understand what you might call braiding non-degeneracy or re also remote detectability, which is another word in the title, um, which is just the idea that any topological excitation which in two plus one in two plus one dimensions, I mean an anion, but more generally some kind of some kind of excitation that can't be created locally, can be detected remotely by some other topological excitation. So that is, it participates in a unitary S matrix, a unitary braiding matrix. And in the case of two plus one dimensions, this is the modular in the unitary modular tensor category. It's the statement that uh, the S matrix is non-degenerate. And so using this uh, this torus trick, we can show that actually. Um, maybe not quite any, but a, a large, basically any excitation that you can think of, or that we've been able to think of, participates in a unitary S matrix, which is a which is a axiom of these other other approaches. Okay, and um, and a, yeah, a key ingredient in that in in showing that there's such a unitary S matrix is is a, a, a definition which 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 we call pairing manifold, which is a kind of complicated definition, but um, also very highly constrained, um, and and from it um, we can prove lots of things. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a fruitful concept, which allows us to count excitations um, in a in a pretty non-trivial way. It gives us some insights into the you know the reason that uh, Kataev and Preskill and Levin and Wen had to consider this particular combination of entanglement entropies to 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 produce the topological entanglement entropy, and it also leads to Verlinde formulae, which which um, is a relationship between the S matrix and uh, well, let's say let's say something about fusion. Maybe that's the that's the that's the best way to describe. It. Um, so, which which generalizes the, the ordinary thing in in the familiar linear format. Yes, question. No, 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 no. I was just moving the camera. Sorry. Ah, okay, okay. Um, all right. So, so oh, by the way, I guess so. The the name S matrix uh, is in is comes from the fact that in the Ordinary two plus one dimensional theory of anions, um, the the pairing manifold is is the torus, and this S matrix is related to the um, the element of the mapping class group that exchanges the two cycles of the torus, right? The S the S transformation of SL two Z, um, and so you might have expected that the the mapping class group of the pairing manifold would play an important role always, but actually this turns out not to be the case. So this was a bit of a surprise, um, which I'll, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I hope to come back to that. And, All right. So, to, sorry, John, just to be clear, the, the S matrix has nothing to do with the S matrix. That's yes. what I'm saying. Yeah. In general, it has nothing to do with the S matrix. Yes. <laughs> so maybe we should have called this something else. I don't know. Oh, no, no, but it also has nothing to do with the scattering matrix. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's true. You're right. That letter is really overloaded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so unfortunately, I mean, okay. I, I guess maybe maybe this is some evidence of cowardice on my part, but nothing is going to move in this talk. <laughs> no, there will be no, no, nothing will be scattered. Yeah. Um, so, but it's you know, I want I want to think of it as the first step in a in a a, a broader program for a different way of thinking about quantum field theory. Yeah. Great. Um, can, you, okay. can you explain what what is this S, S matrix supposed to be physically? The one that I'm actually going to talk about. Yeah. So so a good way to think about it is um, suppose that you have a pair of anions. Uh, so you, so on top of this ground state that we've been speaking about, suppose there are two excitations, two 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 point like excitations. Um, you can imagine grabbing one of them. And and adiabatically moving it around the other one until it comes back to itself and ask what phase is acquired by the state. Yeah. So it's 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 the braiding matrix and and oh and I guess uh, okay. yeah 
Mm, okay. Yeah, that's 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 the good that's a good picture to have in mind. Um, okay. So, an important question that that I need to, we need to answer to get started is: I said we're going to assume that the that the state we're given this reference state on the ball is is a liquid topologically ordered ground state, and and how are we going to implement implement that assumption? So one way to do it might be to assume that we have a Hamiltonian and demand that the Hamiltonian annihilates the state, something like that. But actually, in this talk, there will be no Hamiltonian. So this is the kind of thing that drives condensed matter physicists crazy, right? You know, if 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 with, within five minutes of the beginning of a talk, uh, the speaker has not said what is the Hamiltonian, someone will ask, well, what is the Hamiltonian, right? You know what I mean? Um, so so the people who ask that question may be a little frustrated, but by this talk. Because I will, I will not choose a Hamiltonian at all. So I'm just going to, I'm going to start with the state. I'm going to, but I'm going to make some assumptions about the entanglement structure of the state. So I'm going to assume two axioms about its entanglement, which look like this. So, so like I said, we're thinking about there's some underlying lattice, and I'm going to draw some collections of regions, which I want you to think of as just like a few lattice spacings, right? Or maybe, maybe ten, you know, ten lattice spacings on the side, if you like. Um, and so the assumption is that given a ball like this. Um, if I if I partition it into an interior and its boundary, then I'm going to assume that this uh, this combination, which um, for those of you who know is the combination that appears in the Iraqi Lieb inequality, um, is is vanishes. So so the, the Iraqi Lieb inequality is saturated. And uh, and secondly, for this this combination, which is the com which is a, a a combination that appears in one version of strong subadditivity. I'm going to assume that that, ver that version of strong subadditivity is saturated. And um, so I want to assume this for any, you know, on any disk of a few lattice sites in this reference state. It's an assumption about this, the input state. And um, okay, these axioms turn out to be really nice and really powerful. I guess they were first suggested by Isaac Kim. Um, and uh, here's some intuition for the axioms. Um, the, the A0, um, implies that if I take any region A outside of, of this disk, then it implies that the mutual information between the interior of the disk C and that region A outside exactly vanishes. So this is a, this is a pretty strong assumption. Um, and, and similarly, A1 implies that for any region A outside the disk, the conditional mutual information vanishes. So meaning the mutual information between A and C, so C is the interior of this, this ball and, and A is some, any region outside, um, conditioned on B, B think B is for buffer. That's a, a useful mnemonic to think about. It's the buffer between the interior and the outside um, that that vanishes. So, that, so in particular, the state on ABC is what's called a quantum Markov chain. That's that's a you know any state where strong subadditivity is saturated. Um, so one thing you may okay. So one one thing you can prove pretty immediately from the axioms is that if the axioms are true on a small ball then they're also true on any region whose topology is the same as these, as these pictures. So you can extend the axioms to, you know, to big balls uh, and deformed, deformed balls, as long as the topology is the same, as long as there's an interior and its thickened boundary is separated into B and D or into B. Um, okay, so, so, so Sorry, one John, thing you can... John, yeah, please. Can these, uh, these conditions kind of as the existence of a gap could, could is that a good uh, way to think about them that, you it's, know, it's, you know, yeah it's encoding it's a little stronger than that it's but it, it's that's the idea it's encoding the fact that this is a uh, a gap a gap ground state yeah that's that's the goal that's 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 the right way that's the, the right spirit uh, in without, which to think about introducing it. the Hamilton exactly <laughs> exactly exactly um, so but I have to I have to confess that the axioms are actually stronger than we re would really like. Um, because, so you can see that, you know, this A0 says that the, the mutual information between the, in, you know, between the region C and something over here uh, is exactly zero. And you may know that the mutual information between two regions is an upper bound on connected correlations between operators in those two regions. And so, so th this says that actually the, this is really, the axioms are really only exactly true at, at fixed points, at fixed points where the correlation length is zero. So, you know, so I really want to describe a wave function at a generic point in a phase, a gap phase of matter, where you know, the correlation length may be small, but not zero. And the thing I'm, I'm actually describing, literally describing, is just, just, the, just the fixed point 
in the, representing the face. However, however, is it already encoded? I mean, the, the, the very fact that you said it's uh, mutual information between C and outside region without ever referring to how thick the B region is, it kind of already implies that you are assuming that your mass gap is, uh, 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 is infinite, basically, that, you know. That's right. So that's what, that's what I mean by too strong. That's right. So, however, however, um, there's a strong expectation, which we haven't been able to prove yet, but there's a lot of evidence for it, that as you, as if you take bigger and bigger regions, the, the, the violation of the axioms gets smaller and smaller. So, you know, in the sense, in a familiar sense that you approach the fixed point as the regions get bigger and bigger and the axioms become better and better satisfied. And so, so in this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to use theorems that, that assume it, exact the exact axioms however there's a big edifice of quantum information theory so you know the kinds of things we're going to use are are uh, you know stuff about quantum markov chains uh stuff about you know states that saturate its strong subadditivity um there's a big a big quantum information theory literature about states that are approximate quantum markov chains states which are you know nearly saturate strong subadditivity and uh, let's just say there's good reason to expect that everything will still be true in that case. Um, but this is this is a, at the moment a, a, a hole in the in the program, something that needs to be needs to be filled in. Okay, so I guess one other good thing I should say in favor of the axioms is that um, a zero by itself implies an area law, implies the area law for a round ball. So in that sense, it's a it's an implementation of of the, the area law, um, and actually it's it's not too hard to see. So th just think about think about um, C being really big, so B is just is of order the the, air, the volume of B is just the the area of the boundary, and then um, if this vanishes, it says that the entropy of B C is uh, uh, let's see um, we could it's it's nearly the same as uh, uh, the entropy of B right it, 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 we can bound it. By by the entropy, of, by the entropy of B, because um, SC is positive. Yeah, so so it it implies the area law for round walls, and then combining a zero and a one, as I said, we can deform the shape. So so yeah, a one is really responsible for our ability to deform the region, and so it says that the area law is true for arbitrarily shaped regions, and in particular that the subleading term, this TEE, is is universal. Um, so it, it, you may know that. Uh, there's a phenomenon of, of uh, fake TEE. There are some states where the subleading term in the entanglement entropy for certain regions is non-zero, but there's actually no topological order. Um, and eventually it was understood that this, this happens in systems where there's some kind of subsystem symmetry. Um, and so actually A1 rules out that pathology. Um, okay, maybe you weren't worried about that, so never mind. Um, okay, so... Um, so that's that's the starting assumption, and now let me describe the sort of central actor of the entanglement bootstrap, which is this notion called information convex set. So maybe this actually this may be the most important important slide for understanding the rest of the talk. Um, the idea is to associate to each region of space. So such as here's a here's an annulus X. I'll draw the picture in two dimensions, but it, but it, the region could be any any let's say any manifold. Um, which is part of the ball for now. Um, we're going to associate to it a convex set. So it's it's a convex set of density matrices whose support is on that region. Um, and the definition is the the set of density matrices which are locally indistinguishable from the ground state, from the reference state, from the given state. Um, so you see, so what, by locally indistinguishable, what I mean is you look at any any little ball inside the region X and ask and demand that the, the density matrix that we're looking at is the same as the reference state, is the same as the given state on the big ball, on, on that little ball. So you might think, so this is a, it's, it's a strong condition, right? It demands that local operators can't distinguish between the reference state and an arbitrary state in the information convex set. But there, there is nevertheless non-trivial information in the set of density matrices because, so here's a, here's a, a very useful picture to think about. Although we're demanding that the state is, agrees with the ground state on the annulus, 
the state could differ wildly from the ground state anywhere else. Right? So in particular, there can be an excitation, say, inside the whole of the annulus, which is connected by, by some, uh, some operator that preserves the vacuum to, to some you know, antiparticle outside. And so, um, so the, the, the states in the information convex set um, know about these kinds of excitations that can't be created locally. Right, so, so the, the key thing about an anion is that it's not created by a local operator, rather it's created by the end of a string. The string, the interior of the string preserves the vacuum, but nevertheless it does something. It does something non-local to the, to the density matrix on this, on this annulus. Okay, so that's, that's the, this is the key, the key definition. And it's a good definition because this information convex set of a region is a, is a topological invariant in at least two senses. So first of all, from, because of the axioms, it's possible to show that the information convex set is the same. It's, it's preserved by smooth deformation of X. So if I, if I you know, rather than taking a round annulus, I mush the annulus, the, 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 the convex set is the same. What I mean by the same of, of a convex set is that um, the extreme points are the same, the entropy differences between those density matrices are the same, and fidelities between those density matrices are the same. So that's, that's what I mean by isomorphism of convex sets of density matrices. And then secondly, the information convex set should be insensitive to small changes of the reference state within the phase. Uh, so, you know, implicitly everywhere on this information convex set, there's a label which is which quantum state we're starting with, which reference state we're using, which I'm going to suppress everywhere because I'm, you know, essentially always going to imagine we're talking about the same state. But, but the claim is, and I don't know how to prove this yet, that, that it should be a property of the phase, a phase of matter, right? The information convex set for a given, a region of a given topology. So this is a, so th therefore this is a, a label, on phases of matter. The inf information convex set of any region is a label on, 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 should be a label on phases of matter. And also it's a topological invariant of the, of the region. So it's a pretty interesting thing, I think. So, um, John, John, could I ask a question? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, please. So um, imagine I just take my state psi and I trace out everything outside X. That gives me one density matrix that satisfies all the criteria. Is that, is that one of them inside this information? Exactly. Okay, I see. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that so, um, it, it, and I'm gonna, I'm going to call that the vacuum. Yeah, ah, that's, okay. that's, <laughs> a, that's an important element of the information coming okay. But yeah, but indeed okay. there can be others because uh, I before I before I traced out everything else, I could have acted with some operator that created any else. Right. Right. Very good. And um, another dumb question: What when you say convex, what does that actually mean? Um, like convex. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, convex combinations. So given two elements, a convex combination is is also an element. So. Um, I see. Yes, meaning if you weight them with some probability distribution. Um, there was another question, I think. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, so yeah, so here's a picture of two convex sets. So actually there, th this dichotomy between these two, two kinds of convex sets is very important. So one possibility is that it could be a simplex, right? Meaning that the extreme points are isolated. And so, you know, everything inside this, the simplex is an element of the convex set. Um, but yeah, the extreme points are, are you know, you can't deform them a little bit to another extreme point. And the other possibility is that it could be something like a, the block ball, right? So the block sphere is the set of pure states on a single qubit, uh, and the interior of the block ball is the convex set of density matrices on a single qubit. And so the extreme points in that case, of the extreme points of the state space of, of a finite dimensional hyperspace is, is, uh, has the property that the convex, that the extreme points are continuously variable, right? I can, you know, consider smoothly, smoothly varying the extreme points. So that, that dichotomy will actually be very, very, very important. Um, but but an, an important point in either case is that the convex set is specified by its extreme points. If I know the extreme points, then I can get an arbitrary point by convex combinations. The extreme points are pure states? Is that what you call extreme points? What do you call extreme points? They're not necessarily pure states. So they're still, they're still density matrices, because remember, we're thinking, about, we're thinking about density matrices on some part of the whole system. Um, but, but you're right that in this case, there's a sense in which there's, an, there's a pure state associated with these, these, these density matrices. And it's essentially, okay. Ha, um, so how do you define extreme points? They're just oh, the output of the region? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, let's see. Um, it means you can't make it as a converse combination of other points. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So that, yeah, that's a yeah, that's that's well defined by itself. That's right. Um, okay. Okay. Good. So, and so why, I mean, that's what makes them special, basically, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a that's a general property of convex sets, right? That that it's specified by its by its uh, extreme points. Um, so one first important result is what's the information convex set for a ball? And the answer is that there's just there's just the state that Nabil, that Nabil talked about, just the state that you get by tracing out everything outside the ball. And a way to see that is the following. So so here's the ball whose whose information convex set we're thinking about. Start with a little ball inside. And then by the following process, we can enlarge that little ball until it covers the whole ball. And the process by which we enlarge it is, imagine drawing a little, a little disk at the boundary of the ball and divide that disk up into three parts, which we call B, C, D. So C is the interior and B and D are the boundary of that little ball. And notice that um, by assumption, by, by axiom one, this particular combination of entropies vanishes and that has the consequence that the state on ABC is a quantum Markov chain. So that's, that's the, here, the, I'm just using the axe A1 in exactly this way. Um, it implies that ABC is a quantum Markov chain. And that, that means that, so a key property of quantum Markov chains is that they're unique. So that it's, the quantum Markov chain is the only state that saturates strong of additivity and has the, same, has the given marginals. On, on the parts. And so that means that there's a unique state by which you can extend the ball to this larger ball with a little dimple, and then you can keep doing that. And so thereby you can add little wiggles and, and grow it until it fills the whole ball. And, uh, and that's, it's the only possible state. So the, the key thing is we can add these little balls as long as we don't change the topology of the region. So this is, this is the idea behind why the information coming set is a topological invariant in this particular case. Um, okay. So a few, let me summarize a few results that have been proved with this technology in two dimensions. So this is from this paper by Bowen and collaborators. So the first result is that the information coming out of the analysis is a simplex. So meaning that the extreme points are isolated. And furthermore, they're orthogonal. The, the, the extreme points are orthogonal to each other. And maybe, okay, it's kind of inevitable that those extreme points, the labels on those extreme points should be associated with anion types. And the reason for that is this, this picture, right? You can you know, pick an anion. If I you know, put anion type A inside the, inside the annulus, I'll get, it's, you know, I'll get an extreme point and labeled by A. That's the idea. And maybe, the, but the best internal evidence for this statement is that starting from this assumption that extreme points of the, of the information coming out of the annulus are labeled by anion types, we can reconstruct a lot of the, the, the familiar theory that of super selection sectors that it's supposed to satisfy. So in particular, the information convex set of the two hole disc labeled by three anion types on, on these little, the little annuli of the thickened boundary of the two hole disc um, produces fusion spaces. So what I mean by that is the information convex set of this thing is of, is of this form. So there is some Hilbert space. There are some pure states lurking behind, behind the scenes. And those pure states, the Hilbert space of those pure states has some dimension, which is some integer NABC which you should think of as the, as the dimension of the fusion space of those of A, A and B into C. And it's possible to define the quantum dimension, that's another property of super selection sectors of anions, in, as an entropy difference between the, the, den, the density matrix, the given extreme point and, and the reference state. Um, Okay, and this definition of quantum dimension, one thing that it has going for it is it you can check that it agrees with a sort of more, more familiar definition as the positive solution of this equation. So it's sort of the, yeah, the, the leading eigenvalue of the fusion rules. Um, John, can you explain? I, I, I don't think I understand this uh, statement. Uh, extreme points are associated with any times. How, how is that described by the picture? Is that well, yeah, so this is this is a picture of so I, I, I want I want you to think about the density metrics on this annulus. If you trace out everything outside the annulus after acting with this operator that creates an annulus, right? So the idea is, you know, the, the blue part of the operator. So it's, it's, a, it's a unitary operator that where the blue part, if it were a closed string, it would it would map a ground state to a ground state. But because it has endpoints, it creates some excitations at the endpoints. 
Um, and those endpoints come with labels. That's, that's, that's what I mean by an anion type. And for each such postulable label, it's not too hard to show that you get, you get an orthonormal state on the annulus. So that's, that's, the, that's the picture of why ext extreme points correspond to anion types. But it's actually, it can be understood just internally from the entanglement bootstrap that, that it's sort of inevitable to make that identification. Um, Did that help? Uh, not really, but let's let's move on. Uh, let, let's move on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe so. So that's a so maybe, maybe it's I the mean, last day thing uh, as well. But uh, <laughs> okay. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe you'll, maybe you'll uh, get into the question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You, uh, yeah. So she's so so why you get the da squared if you compute entropy? Because entropy seems to count just a number of degree of freedom. But why do we get squared? Oh, um, that square is actually a, a great source of annoyance. Essentially, the reason is that the annulus has, has the boundary of the annulus has two components. That's why there's a two there. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, that's, thank you very much. Yeah, it, yeah it's actually, I think if, if we were to go back in time and define quantum dimension again, starting from entanglement bootstrap, we would not have put a square there. <laughs> that's a, yeah. Um, okay. So, and then finally, you can extract the, the topological entanglement entropy uh, from, from the reference state uh, essentially in the same way as, as before. And, and, and you can prove that, that, this, that this conditional initialization is related to the total quantum dimension where D is defined by this formula. Okay. So, the, so those, are, those are some results in two dimensions. Um, but actually the axioms extend very naturally to any dimension. So in three dimensions, we can, I can draw the axioms as volumes of rotation. So it's exactly the same picture. The only difference is that now I'm divide instead of dividing a disc, I'm dividing up a ball. B is still the thickened boundary of the ball in axiom zero. And in axiom one, B D is the thick is combined to be the thickened boundary of the ball. And the basic results generalize, in particular the information convex state is still an invariant to deformations of, of the region. Um, and now we can ask, well what generalizes the annulus? As, a, as the thing that detects the topological excitations. And here, there, there are many possibilities. So the most obvious, like maybe the simplest generalization of the annulus is the, the sphere shell. The sphere shell is the thing that surrounds a particle in three dimensions. Another possibility is we could think about the information convex set of the solid torus. And that's something that detects excitations that are loops. So here, the, the red is always where the excitation is. And this shaded stuff is, is an operator that preserves the vacuum, right? So this is a loop is a, an operator that's created by a membrane, sorry, is this excitation that's created by a membrane operator. And, and this, so this is another, gener, another 3D generalization of the annulus. Um, and in fact, there are other possibilities, um, which, which I'll say something about. Um, but first, maybe I should, I should okay, I, I said I wasn't going to write a Hamiltonian, but here's a Hamiltonian. I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I had, there, yeah, I guess I, I've been hanging out with the kinetic matter physicists for too long. Um, so a good example to keep in mind is just gauge theory in three plus one dimensions with whose gauge group is a finite group. So in a Hamiltonian version of that theory was written down by Kataev. It's a, it's a nice, you know, sol solvable point in the, in the phase diagram, um, which is described in terms of two sets of, of commuting operators one of which acts on the, on the links. And this, this term imposes the Gauss law, if you set A, a equal to one, and, and, the, and the other more familiar plaquette term. Um, and uh, in this case, I can tell you exactly what the excitations are. So the particle excitations are labeled by irreducible representations of G, the finite group. Um, and the, the, their quantum dimension is just the dimension of the representation. Uh, and the total, the, their total quantum dimension is just the order of the group. And the loop excitations are labeled by conjugacy classes of the group. So they're, um, and their total quantum dimension is just the, the square root of the number of elements in the conjugacy class. And yeah, the total quantum dimension is again, just the order of the group. Um, and a crucial idea for, for learning about uh, information convex sets uh, in, three, in, in solvable models is the no, this notion of minimal diagram. It's, it's a sort of entanglement or normalization group idea that you only need to, if, if, you, want to, if you want to study the, the, this solvable model on some region, you only need enough links uh, on the graph. You only need a simple enough triangulation so that 
it encodes the, the right topology. So essentially starting with, starting with the fine lattice on the region, you can do a set of moves to remove links, to simplify the graph to, to down to some kind of minimal diagram. Um, and so, so then it, these, answering these questions becomes just like a finite, you know, three-dimensional problem, something like that. Okay, so, so that's a good example to keep in mind. Um, and so I wanted to explain that there are other excitations besides particles and loops. And one example is that you can, you can fuse two loops together. And there are several ways to do that. And the more interesting way to do it is to fuse them so that they share, a, share an edge, so that the resulting excitation has the topology of a graph. And in fact, there's a, these excitations are distinct from just the two loops together. Um, and they're, labeled, they're, they're detected by the information convex set of a genus two handle body. So here's a picture of the genus two handle body. It's just genus two ribbon surface with the inside filled in. And that detects excitations, which you know, sort of link with, with the genus two handle body. It's, it, it's information convex set is also a simplex. And they're not just two loops stuck together. For example, if you think about the quantum double model with gauge group S3, um, the information convex set of the genus two handle body has 11 sectors, but there are only three types of loops. And so, you know, putting two loops together only gives nine excitations. So there's something else. That's, that's, that's my point of this inequality. So the, the, these graph excitations are something new, which is, which is a bit more mysterious. Um, there can also be excitations that are, that are shaped like, that are knotted, right? And instead of just a, 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 an excitation that's a loop, that's, a, that's the unknot, we can imagine that first it's tied into a knot. Um, and then there, and, and those are detected by the information convex set of the complement of that knot. And there are also excitations which are like a combination of a, a loop and a particle, which are created by a single operator, which is, which is actually not supported on a manifold, supported on this thing, which is partly a surface and partly a line. Um, and those are, that, that thing is detected by the information convex set of the torus minus the ball, which I've drawn here. Okay, so that was, so, so maybe that's, I've indicated that there's a somewhat overwhelming multiplicity of, of things to consider in three-dimensional topological order. Um, here's a, an important uh, dichotomy in the in, in information convex sets of various regions. It's the information convex set stores two kinds of data, which is, this is exactly the dichotomy that I was drawing before between simplices and block balls. So the, the, the condition on the region for the information convex set to be a simplex is that the region is what's called sectorizable. Sectorizable is a condition just on the, on the topology of the region, which is that a region is sectorizable if it, can, if it contains two copies of itself. So like here's a picture of the annulus, it can be subdivided into two disjoint annuli, L and R, and uh, each of which can be extended to the whole annulus. And this is, this is, it's really a very good definition because for regions of this case, it means that you can copy the information in, in the density matrix, right? By taking the reduced density matrix on R, I, it knows all about the information of the original state because I can extend it back to the original state. And so the information, so in this case, um, the, the information stored in the information convex set is, is totally classical information, right? Classical information can be copied. That's, I guess that's, that's the best definition of classical information. Um, and uh, actually, there's a really, there's a really nice proof of, of, this, of this fact, just starting from the demand that the region is sectorizable. It means you can chop it up into some parts. Um, and then using the isomorphism theorem that you can def, you know, deform the parts back to itself and monotonicity of the fidelity, so comparing you know, the fidelity of two states is, is it, this is the, there's a famous picture in Chuang and Nielsen that explains this inequality that if you look at only part of a picture, you have, you, it's, it's harder to tell the two things apart, right? If you draw two, if you draw a smiley face and a frowny face and erase the bottom half of the picture, you can't tell them apart. But if you have the whole picture, you can tell them apart. So that's, that, that's, that's this inequality. But um, for extreme points, the, the state factorizes between L and R, and therefore the fidelity is less than or equal to the fidelity squared, which for a number between zero and one means it has to be either zero and one, which means that the extreme points are orthogonal. Okay, so that, that's a, a sketch of this proof. It's in a gray box. You can ignore it if you want. Um, 
Okay, so the other possibility besides sectorizable region, if the region is not sectorizable, then there's possibility that it stores quantum information, genuine quantum information. And what is that quantum information? You should think of it as the fusion spaces of the excitations. So a good example there is this two hole, two hole disk. So you can think about the annulus that surrounds this hole that's in sector A of the annulus information copy set. This one is in sector B, this one is in sector C. And the state of the whole thing encodes some combination, some quantum combination of those things. And the general, the general theorem about the structure of information convex sets is once I label the boundaries, label the states of the thickened boundaries, so here I've labeled them ABC, what's left is the state space, curly S, of some, some, uh, of some Hilbert space, which some, some Hilbert space labeled by those excitations, which has some dimension, that dimension is the fusion space. So the general statement is that the information convex set of an arbitrary region is a convex combination, that's what I mean by this plus sign of convex sets, convex combination of information convex sets which, with fixed boundaries. And each of those information convex sets with fixed boundaries is itself a block ball of some kind. Okay, so, if, so for example, in the case of um, the ball minus two balls, the, each of these thickened boundaries is labeled by a particle type, which is in the case of the quantum double model, let's think about the quantum double model, is labeled by some irreducible representation of the group. And then there's some, some state space associated with those three labels, which is, in this case, it's just group theory. It's just the structure constants of the fusion ring of the irreducible representations of the finite group. It's like, yeah, what else could it be? Um, okay, so I think I have two more slides of, of introduction to entanglement bootstrap, and then we'll take a break. So, so bear with me for another minute here. Um, a key tool for proving these results the, sim the simplex theorem and the, and the structure theorem is, is this, this notion of merging. It's the statement that given, given states in the information context sets of two regions that overlap, right? So A, A, B, and B, C, they overlap on B, and they suppose they agree on B. So the reduced density matrices on B are the same. Then they can be merged to a unique state in the information context set of A, B, C. You can, you can combine. So in general, this problem of, of combining density matrices which agree this quantum marginal problem is a really difficult problem, which, you know, it's, it's not solved in general. But here, because of the extra assumption of the axioms, uh, there's actually a unique solution. So it's a very, very powerful statement. And that unique solution, maybe unsurprisingly, is a, it's a quantum Markov chain, which, which necessarily is the maximum entr entropy state consistent with the marginals on these regions. And moreover, this merging process preserves entropy differences. So the entropy differences of the original things is equal to the entropy differences of the final thing. So this is a very powerful tool, and, and it's the reason that this isomorphism theorem is true. So I think I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explain, I'm not gonna explain this in detail, but um, uh, the idea of why the information convex set is unchanged by deforming the region is essentially that I can, you know, I can add little balls to the region, and, and I can make a, a state, I'm guaranteed that there exists a state on this extended region because of this, um, because of this merging, merging process. Um, okay, so a particular application of merging is the case when A, and A, A B, and B, C, um, when we merge a whole boundary of these things. So here's a good picture to keep in mind. So suppose A, B is this yellow, and the yellow and green thing, and B, C is the green and blue thing. So I should have labeled them. Um, so I merge, so, so there was a boundary of AB here, which is now which is now gone, right? In the in the in the merged thing, I've healed this boundary. In that case, actually, this this merging process gives a, a relationship between the fusion dimensions of the spaces. So it's which which says that the the, fu the fusion dimensions of the whole thing is just sum over all possibilities for the sector on the boundary that you glued of the fusion dimensions of the of the parts. And this is called associativity theorem because one application of it is to show that for particles in two dimensions, the information convex set of the three-hole disk is not really independent of the two-hole disk. So some of the crazy multiplicity of all the possible regions goes away because I, only, I really only need to know about the annulus and the two-hole disk in two dimensions. Because so this is you know associativity of fusion that the result of merging this way is the same as the result of merging this way, and both of them give the the two-hole the, the, the three-hole disk. Um, okay, maybe maybe this is a good place to stop. I'm yeah. Um, 
Hmm? Yeah, thanks. Uh, how long of a break were you thinking? I don't know. How long a break do you need? <laughs> uh, it's, it's up to you. It depends on how much you have. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, if you... If you, if you okay. Uh, how about five minutes? That's that's a, minutes maybe five. that's a yeah, safe yeah, one. Yeah, five minutes is time. Five. Oh yes. Hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? You're over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get some drink. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think maybe I will too. Hi John. Can I ask you a philosophical question about um, about what's happening with the information convex sets? Um, Please. I'm not sure if it's of general interest. So I'll, I'll ask you now in the in the break. So whenever you say these things, I find it easiest to imagine uh, actually starting with the the full state space, acting with the anions or whatever, and then tracing them out, and then getting some density matrix, and then everything you say sounds very plausible that it would happen. But I feel like I'm cheating because I thought that's exactly what you don't want to be doing. Is is that that's right? That's cheating. Yeah, that's cheating. Okay. It's, so, yeah, however, yeah. however, yeah. Um, it, it's possible to so yeah I actually I have a better a better answer to Tin's question about why the extreme points correspond to the anion types which is that it's possible to construct the string operators mm -hmm. from, from starting from the axiom so it's possible to prove that there exists a unitary operator whose support is is on a string um, that that creates the extreme points from from the reference state so it's so it's it's sort of cheating in the sense of, I mean, this is of course also what I did to, to understand what was going on. Um, yeah. But, but it, because the string operator, that's sort of a, a later development in, okay. in the entanglement bootstrap. Um, but but um, I, I don't think you'll go wrong. You won't go wrong by, okay, by thinking. Okay, right, right. Okay, so that, that gives you the right results, but the whole point is to, to get all of that without, without doing what I just said. Is that-, is that without, assu without assuming that you can do it, yeah. Do it. Okay, okay, let's see. Yeah, you know it's a, that's a, that's the right picture to have in mind. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Then I feel better. Um, 
and these extensions are crazy. The um, the many linked things and all of the, this zoo of things in 3D. There's right. really quite a zoo. Yeah, yeah, these are not classified, or or are they all classified, or what's the what's the? Current I, I don't I don't think they are. Okay. I don't. Yeah. Um. I yeah. Sir, and we don't we don't yet know a set of like uh, um. Gen a generating set of regions, right? So so I was just explaining that. In, in two dimensions, you only need to know the annulus and the two-hole disk, right? And from right. there, essentially because of this kind of relation, you can, you can right. construct the information kind of set in a region with arbitrarily many holes. Um, right, right, the analog right. of that in three dimensions, I, it's, right. it's, really, it's really pretty mysterious. Um, which, and so you could worry that to fully characterize a, a 3D topological order, you need to know all, all, of, all of those things independently. Right. Right, right, right. That's that's a logical possibility. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, people think that we actually there's a sort of I think kind of pessimistic point of view that actually the only topological phases in three dimensions are various kinds of discrete gauge theories. Okay. Which, um, yeah, I don't know if it's true. Okay. But um, if that is, then then all these numbers can be calculated and they're all determined by some small set of some small set of data right. or right. Okay. Right, if that's true, yeah. I see. There, and even if it's not true, there may be some way to calculate it from a small set of data, but we don't know it. Right, right, right. right. What, what the minimal set of data is, I see. Right. Okay. So I like that you had a like a screensaver for the break times. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> Did that? I don't think I even. Uh, uh, what, what happened on your side? I'm not sure. I noticed uh, on, on the on the YouTube streams during the oh, break times. There was oh. this lovely uh, like uh, um, drawing of various uh, symbols related to the, to the oh. workshop. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> See. This is all, all Luca and Tin, I think. Um, I, I sadly had nothing to do with uh, the artistry. Um. Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay we're back. back. Are we back? Are we, Are we rolling? Ready to go? Good. I think we're ready to go. Okay, great. So, so during the during the break, I was just talking to Nabil about a, a, a better answer to Tin's question about why information convex at extreme points correspond to x. Say what, why the extreme points of the information composite of the annulus correspond to um, anion types, and and there's a better answer. It's purely within entanglement bootstrap, but it's a little. It involves a little more technology that I'm not going to explain. But the statement is, it's possible to prove that that it's possible to construct the open strain operators that create the extreme points from give it from a given super selection sector from a yeah. Um, so. Um, so yeah, just purely purely within the entanglement bootstrap, it's possible to prove that this has to be true. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a little more satisfying an answer. Okay, so in the second part of the talk, um, we're going to do some fun differential topology. Um, there's going to be lots of pictures, maybe probably too many pictures, um, but I hope yeah, I hope we'll I hope it'll be entertaining. Uh, so let me let me tell you a little a little bit more about this remote detectability business. So the, the it's a sometimes called a principle. Which you know, but physicists physicists use that word to mean something that they don't know how to prove. Um, uh, which is the idea that every anion should braid non, non braid non trivially with something else. So in three dimensions, that means something like you know a particle. Uh, so he, sorry, here's a picture of a particle. Here's a picture of a loop. The braid the braiding is I move the particle through the through the inside of the loop. The loop operator is created by a membrane, so therefore the world line of the particle has to pass through the membrane. And that's 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 why they can detect each other. And this is an this is an axiom. 
of other approaches to topological field theory, both the categorical approach and uh, uh, an approach that Shagong Wen has been working on. Um, and you know, the idea is, well, if this weren't the case, it wouldn't be an anion. That's, that's, why, that's why this should be true. Um, in the case of the 3D quantum double, you can see that the number of particle types is the number of irreps of the group. Famously, that's equal to the number of conjugacy classes of the group, which is the number of kinds of loop excitations. And, um, and so that means that at least, at least the matrix associated with these two things is square. And plausibly, there's a unitary matrix. So maybe you can guess what the unitary matrix is. Um, and and uh, but we can, we can prove that in general, uh, an, an S matrix defined, well, okay, there are many definitions. One definition is in terms of these open string operators that I was just mentioning. Um, it's one way to think about it is a pairing between an element of the information convex set of the solid torus and these string operators that create particles at the ends. Um, and, and so we can prove that this matrix is unitary. And moreover, it, it participates in a Verlinde formula. A Verlinde formula, the right-hand side is this combination of S matrices, and the left-hand side is something about the fusion of those excitations. And there's another Verlinde formula because this S matrix is appearing between two different things, unlike in two dimensions, there are two ways to write a Verlinde formula, and the other way involves something about the pure flux excitations. Um, and a general consequence of this is actually a constraint on, on uh, all topological field theories in three dimensions, which is that if we know that the particles are labeled by irreps of some group, then because of the Verlinde formula, we know that the pure fluxes, the, the, the loop excitations are labeled by some con the conjugacy class of the group. So this is a big, this is a constraint on topological field theories. Um, okay, in, in, the, in the case of the quantum double model, maybe you've guessed that the matrix that pairs the conjugacy classes and the irreps is the character table. Um, and, uh, and we can actually, we can show that that's the case from this minimal diagram method, which I won't explain in detail. But um, the fact that we have this general proof of unitarity of the S matrix gives it, it's independent proof of the orthogonal, orthogonality relations of, of the character table of, of a finite group. So it's, it's maybe yeah, the least efficient way to prove that the, the characters of the finite group are orthogonal to each other. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's an example illustrating this this consequence. Um, okay, and the, yeah, so the, the integers that appear in those, uh, in the Verlinde formula are the, the structure constants of the ring of irreducible representations and the structure constants of the algebra of classes. So, so you know, maybe familiar things from group theory. Um, okay, so now let me, ex let me explain a little bit of the, the technology that we've developed to, to give a sort of general, a general understanding of these kinds of uh, braiding non-degeneracy relations. And the first, the first step is to explain this, uh, um, how to study closed manifolds, starting from just a, a single reference, a single reduced density matrix on the ball. Okay, so this is called manifold completion. And it has two steps. And the first step is, is, is this notion of immersion. So, so I said earlier that we can define the information convex set for an arbitrary a region, which is a subregion of the ball that we started with. Actually, we can do better. We can define the information convex set for regions that are not subregions. So here in this, this region W, it's, 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 it's sort of contained in the ball that I started with, but as you can see in this, in this locus here, it covers it twice, right? It's not, it's, not a, it's not a single, it's not embedded. This is a good way to describe it. It's not embedded in the ball. And rather you should think of it as being immersed. So immersion is a concept from differential topology. It's, it's a map from something W, some abstract space W into some other space, which in this case is the ball, with the property that the tangent space at each point is non-degenerate. So, so the, in the, Im the image of this thing, it, locally it's, it's a manifold, but globally it, it, can, be, it can be a multiple cover. Um, and okay, so this is, this, is, this is where the Kirby torus trick comes in. The idea is, Kirby's idea, is that given an immersion of some, some say open manifold W, or actually it doesn't have to be, of the manifold W in, into, into the ball of the same dimension, we can pull back structure from the ball to the manifold W. So by pull back, I mean the usual thing. So given some function on the ball, I can define a function on, on W 
that's immersed in it just by composition, right? F of, F of the image of the, of the point W. And so Kirby's original application to this trick was to pull back some kind of smooth, the smooth structure on the ball to define a smooth structure on, actually it was the torus that he was studying. Right? Or I get, maybe he also used it to, to, to pull back piecewise linear structure. More recently in the physics literature, I, I guess you could call it physics, um, Hastings used this idea for his own purposes um, to pull back a Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian for, for, for an invertible phase for some reason. Um, we're going to use it to pull back the reference state. So the reference state on balls. So, so in particular, the idea is I can define the information convex set on W because I, in order to define it, I just need to compare an arbitrary density matrix on W to the density matrix on, on the ball. And I can just compare the density, the density matrix on the image of the, of, the, of the ball in W with the density matrix on the, with the reference state. So I'm, I'm pulling back the information about the reference state from the ball to this, to this region W, to this immersed region W. Um, a few comments. So given a general immersion, if I just draw some crazy thing, crazy immersion, it's not obvious that the information convex set is non-empty, nor that it contains a vacuum state, right? Because I can no longer just trace out the stuff outside. Right? That doesn't make any sense, because what do I do? What do I do here? Um, and so there's some work required to show that there's some notion of vacuum state. Um, but happily, there's a generalization of the isomorphism theorem. So, the so two regions that are related, not just by little extensions, but by any regular homotopy, have, inf have isomorphic information convex sets. So by regular homotopy, I mean that I mean a family of immersions. So, e so each each point in the homotopy is also an immersion. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, so that that was step one. And uh, now I have to explain why was that called the torus trick? And this is step two. So this, this region that I've drawn here, maybe you can see is, is a punctured torus. So here's, here's another picture of it. This is, a picture, this is a picture of a torus, right? Identify opposite sides with a hole, right? This, this hole is connected to this hole is connected to this. There's just one hole. Um, and if I draw that as a sort of embedded thing, it's a torus with a hole. Okay, so, so hopefully you can see that these are the same thing. And the key idea, like the second part of Kirby's torus trick, is that sometimes you can fill in the hole. So not only can you define the information convex set on the puncture torus, you can define the information convex set on the whole torus. And the only thing we need to fill in the hole is that the boundary, so this thing has a single boundary, I guess it's clearest in this picture. We need that, you know, there's a little annulus around that boundary. We just need it to be in an abelian sector. We just need it to be in a state with the quantum information where the quantum dimension is one. And if that's true, then we can, we can, we can merge it with a little, a little disk to fill in the hole and make a reference state on the closed manifold. So this is the, this is the, the key idea of how starting from a reference state on a ball, you can, you, we can study, you know, we can extract information about closed manifolds. And so, okay, so there's this notion of vacuum completion, which is, with some extra assumptions about the, the regions that we're, we're working with, we can guarantee that there's a vacuum sector, and so therefore we can fill in the hole. So one example is starting with the state on the ball, I can fill in the hole to make a sphere. That's the simplest example. And this is extremely useful because then I can, I can deform regions around the back of the sphere, for example. Uh, it helps a lot. Um, and here's, here's the picture for the torus. So this is the region W that I was drawing earlier. Um, this picture here describes building it out of some ingredients that we understand, in particular, where the, the, ba the boundary, uh, this orange boundary here, we can guarantee to be in a vacuum sector so that we can do this merging process and get, and get a state on the torus. And here's a, here's a way to see that we can guarantee that this boundary is in, in the vacuum sector. Um, this region with, the little, with one annulus cut out can be deformed by this series of steps into a two-hole disk. And this two-hole disk, we know, we know about its information convex set. In particular, we know that if this hole is in sector B and this hole is in the same sector B, then A has no choice but to be the vacuum. So this, this big boundary here, which is the boundary of, the, of, the, of this hole, is guaranteed to be in the vacuum sector and we can fill it in. Okay, that's, that's, the, 
that's the key idea. Um, okay, and there's this notion of, of building blocks, ingredients from which we can, we can, we can construct closed manifolds in this way. And uh, that comes with a guarantee that there's a unique canonical state in, which is essentially just the vacuum. Uh, it's a vacuum on the closed manifold associated with um, that particular decomposition. And it, it's guaranteed to reduce to the reference state on, on these parts. Okay. Um, and so here's a similar construction of the genus two surface, right? So anal analogous to this picture, making the genus two surface out of some parts where we can guarantee that we can fill in the holes. Um, okay, so that was in two dimensions. Here's where the, the visualization gets a little challenging. So I want to build, okay, this isn't, this wasn't, okay. I claim that if you take a, a sphere shell and glue the inside and, and, and glue a handle to it to connect the inside to the outside, right? That, that's this picture here, right? This is a sphere shell with a handle connecting the inside to the outside. This, this part of the handle passes through the, the shell. There's no intersection there. It's an immersion. Uh, I claim that you get, and so you get a, a manifold, which is, which is S2 times S1 minus a ball. So this thing has a single boundary, which is a, which is a, a sphere. And if you fill in that, that, that boundary, you get S2 times S1. So that's maybe not so obvious. And I've devoted the rest of the slide to trying to, trying to illustrate that with pictures. Um, so let me, let me try. So it's in a gray box. The whole thing in the gray box is just to, just to show that this is true. Um, so think of, a, think of a, a sphere, a two sphere, as a ball glued to a ball, a disc glued to a disc along their boundaries. Right? That, so if I, take, if I take two discs and glue them together like that, I get a sphere. And now think of S2 times S1 as in the following way. So I cut it, I cut it in half into, into a, a, a disc times a circle. So this is a disc times a circle. Here's a disc, here's a circle. Right? So that's a solid torus and another copy of the solid torus. And if I glue those together along their boundaries, so each, along each slice, a, a fixed point along the circle, I'm just doing this. Right? So this ball glued to this ball gives me a sphere. And so altogether, that's a sphere at each point of the circle. It's S2 times S1. Okay, now cut out a ball from this, an arbitrary little ball, and, and try to grow the ball that you cut out as much as possible. So I claim that what's left is... Um, this blue region here, which is a, a, a ball times an interval, oh, sorry, which is, yeah, a ball times an interval glued to a ball times an interval, which is a sphere shell, right? It's S2 times this interval. And then the other thing I can't remove is this orange tube here. And this is an orange tube that connects the, in, the inside of the sphere shell to the outside of the sphere shell. So that's this picture, right? Here's, here's the blue sphere shell. And this is the orange handle that's connecting the inside to the outside. <laughs> okay, so that, that, that's my attempt to, to demonstrate that this, this produces S2 times S1. Okay, now why, um, okay, I'm not gonna explain yet why I care about making S2 times S1, but this, is, this will be the, a very important example. And so by a similar series of manipulations, we can construct various other things like connected sums of S2 times S1. Connected sum means I take two, two manifolds, I cut out a ball from each of them, and then glue the boundaries of the balls. And, and something that I'm not going to say too much about is there, there's also a large class of examples where there's a gapped boundary. We can also study a reference state in the presence of a, of a gapped boundary with some small generalizations of the axioms to accom accommodate the boundary. Um, so, uh, for example, in this way, we can make Riemann surfaces with boundary, with gapped boundary, like a cylinder or a pair of pants or various things in three dimensions. So there's a lot of examples. That's, 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 that's the point of that slide. Okay, so let me say a few things about which manifolds can be constructed this way. And so this was a very dramatic story for me personally. Uh, so I just showed that we can make every orientable two manifold, every orientable surface in this way. The natural question is which closed manifolds can you make this way in three dimensions or in higher dimensions? So one sort of classical fact from the 50s is, is that if you can immerse a manifold W, an open manifold into the ball, because that immersion is, is uh, an isomorphism of tangent spaces, the tangent space, the, the image of the tangent space is non-degenerate. 
it means it, this is because the tangent bundle of, of the ball is trivial. It means that the tangent bundle of the the manifold that you've immersed is trivial. It gives a trivialization of the tangent bundle. Um, in three dimensions, then, so, and this is, and in fact, it goes the other way. If the tangent bundle is trivial, it's possible to make an immersion. And in fact, the tangent bundle of every orientable three manifold is, is trivializable. And so, in fact, so we can construct in this way reference state on a on an arbitrary orientable three manifold. The the question in four dimensions actually was completely answered in a paper by Mike Friedman that appeared on the archive last week. So I, I spent, I don't know, I don't know how much time trying to Google up the answer to this question. And, you know, I, I kind of figured that it was an open problem and I was seriously considering posting it to Stack Exchange. And, and this paper just appeared and completely answered the question. It's, it, it was totally an amazing experience. Um, and, and the conclusion is the best possible conclusion for us. So we knew, we knew that there were obstructions if, if some characteristic class of the tangent bundle is non-trivial, right? Then in that case, we know that even by, by poking holes in the manifold, we can't immerse it in a ball. But they showed that, that the Stephen Whitney classes of the tangent bundle are the only obstruction to, immerse, to immersing the, 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 the manifold if you, allow, if you allow yourself to make holes in it. So the, yeah, so the, this is great. So essentially, essentially, any manifold you could possibly construct this way, uh, you can construct this way. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there are even generalizations of this construction that are possible. We could allow there to be some kind of defects in the ball that we start with. So places where the axioms are violated, uh, in which case we can make more general things, um, who, whose purpose I'll mention at the end. Okay, so now, so that was a construction of reference states on closed manifolds. Why would you want to do that? Um, here, here's the reason. Um, I want to define a class of manifolds, which I'll call pairing manifolds, um, which have the property that we can build them in the way I've just described in two different ways. So sort of con conjugate constructions of them. And so here, here's a picture for the, for the case of the cylinder with gap boundaries. So one way to cut up the cylinder, it, one way is to cut the cylinder in half sort of vertically into two parts, the purple and orange. And another way is to cut it in half horizontally into two parts, purple and orange. And they're associated with each of these ways of cutting in half the cylinder is a, is a construction along the lines I just described, uh, some reference state on the cylinder. So I'm going to call a manifold, a pairing manifold, if I can cut it in half in two different ways into X in its complement and Y in its complement for each of which I can do this kind of story I was just telling you, with the following properties. I want the intersections between X and Y to, to be balls. I want the intersection between X and Y to be a ball. And similarly for the complement of X and Y and so on. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the, what is the meaning of this condition is that the information in the state on X is hidden from the state on Y. So if their intersection is just a ball, so here's the example of the torus, here's y, here's x, each of them is an annulus, their intersection is this ball. It means that the data in the information convex set of y is totally hidden from the information convex set of x because they intersect just on a ball and there's a unique state of the information convex set on a ball. Um, we want the intersection to be generic, that just means if you deform it a little bit, the topology doesn't change. And then finally, we require that, so x, x here cuts, or y divides x up into a bunch of regions. And we're going to demand that something like uh, axiom one is satisfied uh, in, the, in, the, in the unique state guaranteed by this construction on x. Okay. Um, so this is a definition which, which uh, it's a little complicated, I'm sorry. But um, if we can find examples of it, it's correspondingly very powerful. Uh, so first, let me show you that there are examples, and then let me show you that what we can do with it. So... Um, an example is the genus G surface. It can be cut in half in two ways. We could slice it like a bagel or we could slice it like a donut. Um, and, and the intersections are, are, are balls and, okay, these conditions are satisfied. Um, S2 times S1 is an example. The two, one, a good way to think of the two ways of dividing up are to draw it as, um, draw it as a sphere shell with the inner sphere and the outer sphere identified with each other. Right, so, the, so this is S2, and then this direction is S1. And so one way to cut it in half is to just cut it up into, into a, a sphere shell and its complement. And the other way to cut it in half is to cut it like this, which is, which is a solid torus. 
Okay. Connected sums of S2 and S1 are also examples. The cylinder is an example. Some things are a pairing manifold in more than one way. Not everything is a pairing manifold. For example, T3 fails to be a pairing manifold because the natural ways of dividing it in half uh, intersect in a, in a solid torus rather than in a ball. A pair of pants is also not a pairing manifold for the same reason. Okay, so a question that, that you can ask is, given the region X, so, okay, I, I should have said, what am I going to do with the pairing manifold? The pairing manifold is going to encode the, X, the S matrix between the excitations in X, the excitations detected by X, and the excitations detected by Y. So a natural question is, given X, what is the Y with, in which it participates in a pairing manifold? And the idea is that Y is determined by the, the operators that create the excitations detected by X. So for example, suppose X is the annulus. The excitations detected by X are created by these string operators. If I combine two of them, I get a circle, which is homotopic to another annulus. So for the, for the annulus, if X is the annulus, Y is also the annulus. If X is a solid torus, the excitations are created by these membrane operators. If I combine two of them, I get a sphere. A sphere is homotopic to the sphere shell. Um, if my region is the sphere shell, the excitations are created by string operators. A pair of them is, um, is a, a loop, which in three dimensions is homotopic to the solid torus. Okay, so in each case, the X is paired with a region, which is whose topology is determined by the operators that create the excitations detected by X. This is true in every example. Okay, so here's an overwhelming table, which whose point is to show you that there are a lot of examples that satisfy this definition. And I'll highlight um, this example, this, this, this row of the table, which is about, which includes the case where X is the genus G handle body. So meaning the, the, the region whose information convex set detects these graph excitations that I was talking about. In that case, Y is, X is the genus G handle body and Y is, is the ball minus G balls. It's the thing that detects a cluster of particles which are created by a single operator. The support of the unitary operator that creates them is, is, a, is itself a, a graph. Okay, and the pairing manifold in that case is this connect sum of G copies of S2 times S1. Okay, so, so I've just given a complicated definition. You know, if, I, if you give a complicated definition, you, you should correspondingly get a lot out. And, and indeed, a lot comes out. So one, the first thing we learn is the information convex set of X is isomorphic to that of X bar. Uh, and, and moreover, in each sector, the, the fusion spaces agree. So essentially, X and X bar have to be the same. Um, the second statement can be interpreted as the same that the X matrix is square. It says that the dimension of the fusion spaces, some, some weighted sum of the dimensions of the fusion spaces associated with X is equal to the weighted sum of the corresponding sum for Y. And each of those, in turn, the reason that they're equal is because they're both equal to the, the, the number of ground states on the closed manifold. One consequence of this fact is that it counts these graph excitations for, arbitra for arbitrary number of segments of the graph in terms of the fusion spaces of this ball minus G balls, which for the, you know, for example, for the quantum double, there was some complicated formula for this in terms of uh, sizes of stabilizer groups, some, some average over, over stabilizer groups. So that's a nice application of this formalism. It's, this is not a relation I would have expected a priori. Um, and then finally, the topological entanglement entropies, meaning the, the total quantum dimension associated with excitations of X agrees with the total quantum dimension of excitations with, uh, detected by Y. Okay, so um, continuing the list of consequences, the, the, so we define the state once of X, which is a state on the closed manifold, which reduces to an extreme point on X. In, which in particular is a minimum entropy state. There's, there's an, the, the, when I say that in the definition, X and Y are conjugate here, conjugate vacuum completions, what I mean is the following. They satisfy a sort of uncertainty principle that the state once of X, which, which reduces to the, an extreme point on X, if I reduce it to Y instead, gives a maximum entropy state. And 
In fact, it's, we should, we, it's in a certain sense a maximally entangled state between Y and its complement. Um, and essentially this follows by the same, the same logic as, as we used before, um, that it's uh, this condition that X divides Y into, into a nice partition says that um, this, this state on X is a, this, this state on Y is a Markov chain, quantum Markov chain. And therefore it's a maximum entropy state. Um, okay, so here, finally, I can, I can tell you what is the S matrix. Um, so consider it for simplicity, a case where both X and Y are sectorizable. So there, so then the, this, this results, the, it tells us that the dimension of the, the number of ground states on the pairing manifold is determined, it's equal to the number of extreme points on X and it's also equal to the number of extreme points of Y. And the reason for that is that extreme, we, given extreme points of X, we can make a basis for, for this ground, ground state space on the pairing manifold, which are labeled by those extreme points. And essentially the idea is start with, so here, so here let's think about this solid torus here. Start with an extreme point labeled A of the solid torus and merge it with, with everything else in this picture. That produces a, a, a ground state. On the, on the closed manifold by the by this manifold completion procedure. Similarly, I can start with an extreme point on 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 X, say a, a state labeled alpha of this of this sphere shell, and merge it with its complement, and that produces another set of extreme points. So each of these is an orthonormal basis of the same Hilbert space, and so naturally we can make a unitary matrix that that takes which is the the unitary that takes one basis to the other. So it's 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 unitary by construction. And why is it the S matrix? Well, it's because of this fact that these guys, alpha X, are minimally entangled states along X. And a good definition of the S matrix is in terms of these, these overlaps of minimally entangled states along different, uh, different ways of slicing the space. And so, so far I haven't defined the phases of these states. In fact, we can, we can fix the phase ambiguities because of this uncertainty principle, knowing that uh, one sub X is a maximum, maximum entropy state along Y, um, Deter determines its coefficients. In particular, they're not zero, and so we can use that to fix the phase. Okay, um, there's a that was a simple example where both x and y are sectorizable. If one of them is not sectorizable, such as in this case of the the cylinder with gap boundaries, um, so the extreme points of x still provide a basis. But now, in order to in order to construct a state on the whole manifold from states on y, I need a state not only on y but also on y bar. And, I, then I, and then I glue them together. And so these states are labeled by some extra label I, which lives in the fusion space. And so now the unitary matrix that takes one to, to another is the overlap between this state with a single label on X and this more complicated thing on Y, which has two indices. So the S matrix is, yeah, okay, it has more labels. And again, we, we can partially fix the phase ambiguity. Um, Okay, so, so that, that shows that there's this unitary matrix, which, which is related to this usual notion of S matrix. Um, there are a few other questions we can answer just, for, just from the existence of pairing manifold. Um, one is, why is the topological entanglement entropy a conditional, a conditional mutual information? So the topological entanglement entropy, let's define it as the log of the total quantum dimension of X, and that's, that's from the definition of, of quantum dimension. In entanglement bootstrap, that's just the entropy of the maximum entropy state on X minus the entropy of a minimum entropy state on X. And why should this quantity be related to a conditional mutual information? Well, and and you know what regions should I consider? Well, the, the definition of pairing manifold answers this question because of the fact that it provides a, a decomposition of X, right? Y cuts up X in, in a certain way, and in such a way that um, we're guaranteed to have a Markov, a Markov chain. So the maximum entropy state on, on X is a, is a Markov chain for this partition. And so if we think about the conditional information, mutual information in a minimum entropy state, which for example, could be just the reference state, because the maximum entropy state has zero conditional mutual information, that's the difference. And then this is the definition. And then these three terms just cancel because of the fact that they, the, those states agree, because of the fact that X and Y intersect on balls. And what's left is just the, this 
this difference of maximum and minimum entropies. Um, so I, in some sense, it gives an explanation for what region you should consider to, to construct the topological entitlement entropy. Okay. So finally, um, I want to say a little bit about, about symmetries. Um, so, you know, um, uh, maybe it would have been more natural for me to give a talk about generalized symmetries at this meeting. I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys would have enjoyed it more. I'm not sure. Um, but um, I, can, I can include some discussion of generalized symmetries. And in fact, this, the symmetries that I'll talk about are as crazy as any symmetries that anybody has considered. Um, so in particular, it's possible to construct an algebra of flexible operators on, some, on, on an arbitrary region uh, give, you know, in, the, in this context. And it's, it's the set of operators on the region that satisfy the following condition. For any subregion, zeta in the region, that's obtained by removing balls. So essentially, it means that zeta can be extended by, by adding balls to the whole region. There's an operator um, with the property that its action on any element of the information convex set agrees. So essentially, essentially you can erase the whole region except, except for something that's homotopic to the region. So for, in the case of the annulus, this thing is a string operator, a closed string. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, and this is actually, this actually forms an algebra, meaning if I, if I have one operator that satisfies this condition and another one that satisfies this condition, then their product also does. Um, and, um, a few, a few facts about these things. Um, one basis of this algebra is associated with, with, uh, extreme points of the information convex, uh, infix convex set. Um, notice that these operators need not be invertible. There's no condition that they're invertible, um, but they, but nevertheless, they preserve the ground state, right? So they're in that sense, they're, they can be regarded as symmetries of the low energy theory, symmetries of the topological field theory. And, and moreover, they need not be supported on manifolds. So for example, uh, in the case of the two hole, the two hole disc, the operators I'm talking about are, you know, this kind of graph. Um, and in the example of um, the ball, the, the torus minus a ball, the operator I'm talking about is not a manifold because part of it is two dimensional and part of it is one dimensional, right? So this, so yeah, so I think these are some more ways in which in which uh, uh, symmetry operators can can be generalized, right? I guess I guess maybe this 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 one we've seen before, but I haven't seen this one in the literature before. Yeah, well, could I could I ask a question actually? Um, you said that these preserve the reference state. But I think I'm surprised because I, I think I thought, are these not the string operators that connect the anions between them? Good. Yeah. So my picture is a little bit misleading. I've drawn the little red dots where the anions go just to indicate um, why the operators have this form, the, to indicate their relation to the string operators. But the operators I'm actually talking about in, on this slide um, are closed. Yeah. So you should imagine fusing the anions together and erasing them. I see. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a shortcoming of my picture. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for asking. Yeah. But you you could also make them so they extend off the edges, or, or you're not going to consider those in this in this. What department. do you mean by extend off the edges? Oh, um, I thought uh, to be honest, I thought you were going to say that these are the these are basically the the higher form symmetries of the original theory. Yeah. Uh, is that correct? These are the heart of the original theory. Okay. Yeah. So, um, at some point when I asked you about. Um, I guess in the break, you mentioned that you could construct the line operators even if they went, even if the endpoints were off the edges of the of the um, what's well, of the region. Yeah, of the region. Yes, of the region X. Yeah, that, that's right. So, so um, yeah, these things are closely related. So the the those operators are related by by cutting these operators, right? If you so if you if you you know so the, here here we're showing that there exists like closed string operators that that preserve the vacuum. Okay. And if you, you know, if you stop <laughs> those clustering operators, then you get, you get the, you get the ones that those don't preserve the vacuum because they take right. you to the middle. Okay. 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 Good. Thank you. At, at the end points. Yeah, exactly. Great. Okay. So, so um, there's a second basis. So if, if Y participates in a pairing manifold with some other region X, then there's a second basis for the flexible operators on Y where they're labeled by extreme points of, of, of X instead. So, um, so there's so for each extreme point of x, there's an operator on y that creates this state alpha x, this minimally entangled state on x. Um, 
And these also generate the whole algebra and we can write the structure constants of the algebra in terms of these symbols F. And just from this information, just by studying this matrix element in two different ways, on the one hand, by fusing together uh, alpha and beta, and on the other hand, by um, whatever the other thing is, um, uh, we, can, we can show the following formula. So, so this, this structure constant of the operator algebra is related to this combination of S matrices. Um, and uh, in the case, so one thing to notice is if Y has fusion multiplicity, so meaning that, um, oh, and this, yeah, this trace, by the way, is over the, so if, if Y has a fusion multiplicity, this A comes with an index, an IJ index. And in this formula, you're supposed to matrix multiply those things. So this is like AIJ, AJK, AKI, and the trace is that sum over, over I. Um, and so if, if Y has such a fusion multiplicity, then this operator algebra on X is not abelian, meaning that, that if you reverse the alpha and beta indices, these matrices don't commute with each other, you get, you, you get a, different, a different answer. So this is, this is another generalization of symmetry, right? Where um, uh, there's a, there's, they satisfy a fusion algebra, but that fusion algebra uh, itself is, is non-commutative. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen that example. I've definitely heard Xu Hang say that this is, Xu Hang Xiao say that this is a generic phenomenon, but I don't think I've seen an example of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay. And so that was, so in general, the S matrix is appearing between two different kinds of things. And so we have a choice about, you know, where to put the X's and Y's. And so there's a second Verlinde formula where I switch the roles of X's and Y's. Um, in some cases, we can show that these structure constants F, which a priori, you know, there's no reason for these things to be positive integers. Um, in some cases, we can show that those are related to the dimensions of some fusion space, which is the sort of more familiar version of the Rolinde formula, where the, the thing on, the, on, on this side of the equation is the dimension of some fusion space. Um, only, only in some cases can we show that. We can't show that yet from the definition of pairing manifold. Okay. Um, so, an, an example that I've uh, emphasized... Can I ask a question? Please. So, does it mean that so your definition does not necessarily uh, correspond to the definition from the any online fusion rule? Oh, oh, sorry. One of the examples where we can show this is the usual case of two, two plus one dimensional anions. I see, so, I see. Yeah, so for the case of the, of the torus, this is true. Yeah, then in that case, we know that it's related to the dimension of the... Uh, I see. The uh, then, uh, could, could you explain more about, the, so in what cases this kind of uh, property becomes non-trivial? Yeah, so, so the case which is, which is most mysterious, maybe it's the mm -hmm. only case, is, is the case of fusion of loops in three dimensions. I see, I see. Where oh. these alpha, beta, gamma label pure fluxes mm -hmm. in, in three dimensions. And so um, in the example of the quantum double model, actually, we can show that the numbers are related to the structure constants of the class algebra, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, which are integers in, in the see. right equation. But a priori, we, the, the proof that we know in, that in other examples to, to relate this, these structure constants to a fusion dimension doesn't work in that case, um, despite see, many. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, okay, so um, in two dimensions, in the case of the torus, uh, the reason that the S matrix is called S is because of this, right? Because it's related to the exchange of the two cycles of the torus. Um, but more generally, so say in the case of S2 times S1, which encodes the braiding of particles and loops, the mapping class group, so the, in that case, the pairing manifold is S2 times S1. The mapping class group has two, of the, has two generators. One of them is um, orientation reversal of both factors. And the other one is this kind of generalization of a Dane twist where, let's see, so here's, here's, the, here's the sphere. I've drawn it as, a, as the projective plane. And here's the circle. The, the idea is I do a twist where as I move along the circle, I rotate the sphere by, by two pi. I do a two pi rotation. So that's the whole mapping class group. And nothing there involves something that exchanges the circle and the sphere. 
<laughs> right? There's no notion of, of braiding there. Um, this, this thing is likely related to the statistics instead, something like the T matrix. Um, in the case of four dimensions, for the, for the pairing between loops and loops in four dimensions, which is associated with the pairing manifold S2 to S2, there is again an element of the mapping class group that exchanges the two spheres which is like the S matrix. But in general, the braiding is not related to the mapping class group. Um, okay, actually, this is my last slide. Um, I wanted, yes, a few comments about things we don't understand. Um, there's a generalization of the S matrix, actually several generalizations of the S matrix called punctured S matrix and defect S matrix where, um, well, a, a good way to think about it is it's a, the simplest version is associated with the torus, but with a, um, a defect operator winding one of the cycles, like, like, a, like a duality wall winding one of the cycles. So like in the Torah code, the thing that exchanges E and M. So as you go around this cycle, the E particle turns into the M particle. And so this reduces the number of ground states to two in the Torah code. Um, so in, in this case, um, so we need some kind of generalization, um, but, but actually it, sh it should be possible um, to, to weaken some of the conditions on the Perry manifold. Um, so we, need, we definitely need some generalization because the number of, ex, number of extreme points of X is no longer the same as the number of extreme points of Y, um, but there's still a square S matrix. And so actually I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty confident that we can accommodate this machine, this into our machine. Um, the three torus, which, is the, which would be the perimanifold associated with the torus shell, which, is, which detects general, general loop excitations that are linked with each other, um, Needs, needs something else. And the, the, the thing that happens there is that a given torus shell, like this X here is a torus shell, it's, there is something that, that detects all of its excitations, but it's not a unique region. In order to, in order to, in order to remotely detect all of the, the excitations in X, I need some of the excitations in Z and some of the excitations in Y. And so it's like a, rather than a pairing, it's more like a triality, right? This thing overlaps a little bit with this one and a little bit with this one. So this requires some generalization of what we've done. Um, a sort of paranoid question is, there are some manifolds, some closed manifolds that we can't make by the construction I described, the ones that have a non-trivial tangent model, like for example, non-orientable manifolds or in higher dimensions, manifolds that aren't spin, right? If, if W2 is not, not of the tangent model is non-trivial, like for CP2, we can't, uh, we can't make a construction this way. It's possible that the information on those manifolds is some important, important thing that we need to know that we're missing. Something that makes me feel a little better is that in the definition of topological field theory in terms of the, what is it, a functor from Bordisms to some, some category, they also can't construct a ground state on CP2 because CP2 is not the boundary of any manifold. And so, so maybe, maybe it, there just isn't one or something. I, I don't know. Um, th this is a, I'd very much like to understand more about this. Okay, and then, and then finally, uh, let me return to this big goal that I described of understanding universal properties of a phase just starting from a single representative density matrix. Um, so obviously a lot, of what, a lot of the details of what I've described rely very crucially on these very strong axioms about the properties of the ground state. Something that, Something that leads me to believe, however, that similar ideas generalize to other cases is that um, if instead of thinking about a spatial slice, we think about a slice of the light cone, the ground states of, of more general field theories are also quantum markup chains. So there's this, there are various results about um, uh, partitions of the ground state of in particular conformal field theories in arbitrary dimensions, that if the partition is a, a subspace of, of a light cone, that it's, it's a, a quantum Markov chain. And so this, this gives me some, some optimism that, uh, some, the kind, that the kind of technology I've described actually, actually can be ported to, to field theories with local degrees of freedom. Um, uh, but I don't know how to do it yet. That's a, this is an ambitious goal for the future. Um, okay, thanks. Are there any, there any questions for John? Are 
Brendan from Zoom also is welcome. So, no. yes. Sorry, sorry. Maybe a dumb question, John. Um, the, when you were thinking about these, um, um, these, uh, you know, what's uh, information convex sets? It, it, does one need to imagine? Like, can you represent all the information with a finite dimensional, um, a finite dimensional representation of the? There's not that much information there, right? Even though you start with a many-body system, somehow your axioms reduce it down to just the the bare minimum that you need, right? So can I represent that with just a finite number of degrees of freedom associated with, with every way of, is that how the calculations actually go? In, in so in the, in, the, in the example of the quantum double model, or I think it could be extended also to digraph witten models, in, indeed, it's, it's totally finite dimensional. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the idea of this minimal diagram that um, for, for a fixed point uh, Hamiltonian, a uh, fixed point ground state by a, this series of... Uh, unitary transformations that decouple uh, degrees of freedom, you can, indeed, you can reduce it to um, you know, just a finite number of links and, and plaquettes and sites that are enough to triangulate the region. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, so the, the, the calculations I described in the quantum model are exactly of that form. It's to yeah, totally finite dimensional. Um, and I expect that that's a consequence of the, of the axioms, actually. Right. I don't right. know how to show that. Okay. Okay. But that's not what you're using to actually do the calculations. You're using just the axioms and not, not making some effective model. That's right. So the, yeah, the general, the general results that we've proved are just use the axioms. And yeah, so I, I tried to illustrate them with the yeah, quantum double examples, but indeed you could hope that just from the axioms, you could reconstruct that finite, finite dimensional system. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a, that's an interesting goal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's not I, obvious you're saying, okay. Well, okay. I, some, something that is true is that the in, the information convex set is a finite dimensional convex set, right? So maybe, um, so okay. I should say, assuming that we start with the our, the the system we're starting with has a is a tensor product Hilbert space with a with finite dimensional local Hilbert spaces, mm -hmm. then uh, then the the information convex set is a fi is a finite dimensional convex set, and so indeed you could imagine to trying to you could imagine making a machine that directly outputs that. Right. Finite, a finite machine that outputs that finite dimensional right, right. right. I like that idea. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Um. Any more questions? No. Now let's uh, thank John again. Oh, I guess since I'm the last speaker, I, I should say we should uh, have a round of appreciation for Nabil and Tin and, and David and all the other organizers who I don't remember. <laughs> Just to be able to say. <laughs> Largely Tim, to be honest. But, um, yeah. <laughs> it's like a Markov chain. I mean, you know, it's... Uh... Today has been an especially um, uh, kind of strange day uh, because, you know, we even uh, came here and the building was closed and locked. Even though that was assured, they will keep it open and even staffed. Um, for, which for which they're, they're supposed to charge, charge our grants, but there's, but there's nobody, nobody here. <laughs> <laughs>